here we go. Um, the um, follow-up lecture to the earlier one when I talked to you about gender. This is a this is kind of a weird section because we talk about culture and gender in the cultural expectations, et cetera, of um, of gender and gender places or whatever places and whatever way you want to designate that. But then this, this kind of does a weird switch. Uh, and I'll try to tie all this together for you before we're all said and done with this little section, chapter seven, eight, and nine. Uh, so we're moving out of gender and we're moving into cognition. This one's hard to explain unless you have a good understanding of what cognition is. And I'm going to refresh your memory. As I often say, a lot of this you've had in introductory psychology. Well, this uh, this is another one of those basics. So away we go. What is cognition? Let's run over some basic details. Uh, before we even get uh, into the meat of this. Um, cognition refers to mental processes. And the mental processes are those that we use to um, change sensory input into knowledge. Sounds simple enough. Uh, there's a lot that goes on for that. People often question what is knowledge? Is it useful information or is it information you're just aware of, but you don't know how to use it? We don't have to get into all that. We just take this basic definition and run with it. So all mental processes that we use to transform sensory input into knowledge. Now, we break this down. So we have to figure out where this stuff comes from. Where does this information come from? Well, it comes from several places. Attention is one place. Focusing uh, capacities of consciousness on a particular set of stimuli. That sounds pretty con convoluted, doesn't it? Um, in other words, concentration. Uh, paying attention to whatever the stimulus is. And if it's multiple, whatever the stimuli is. And then we uh, take that and we process that so we can uh, move through that stimuli or stimulus and uh, basically do an analysis. And then eventually that's going to hopefully become knowledge. So that's attention. Next on the list is sensation. And all these, remember, we're talking about cognition here. Uh, sensation in this sense is the five senses, <laughs> not a play on words. So you are exciting, so to speak, sensory receptors, stimulus that's related to those senses. I don't smell something with my eye. I don't taste something with hearing. Although if you have this condition, I won't go into it, then the coding gets messed up and you uh, you run into uh, a problem with that. So we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with straight up sensation. The, f the feelings that you get from the excitement of sensations, all five senses, touch, taste, smell, sight, hearing, so on and so forth. Again, that's part of cognition, understanding these things, working with these things. And then finally, perception. And that's gathering the information about the world around you through your five senses. And then you, you interpret those sensations. That's what perception is. It's not the same as perspective. Perspective is your view. Perception can be, but perception is more about what this means in terms of uh, this being the stimulus, what this means, and how do you uh, interpret that? Now, what, how do we wrap all of that into one, one little nice little picture or a little ball of wax 
And uh, you can say all of what I just said by saying that culture is viewed and it can be viewed in various ways, but in this case, it's viewed as a set of mental representations about the world. What world are we talking about? We're talking about your culture. And sometimes we call that mental programming. So my culture is feeding me. I'm getting information from around me that's telling me what my culture's expectations are in a given situation. Um, if you want a long drawn out definition of culture, then you can say it this way. Uh, human culture is, uh, human culture can be defined as uh, unique meaning and information systems. Those are shared within the groups, i.e. The, the members of the culture, and it's passed along from generation to generation. And what does that do? It allows your culture to adapt to the needs, environmental needs, emotional needs, you name it, food needs, uh, survival needs, well, uh, the, the uh, attainment of well-being, and even pursuit of happiness. What do we do? What, what entertainment do we, uh, do we engage in, <coughs> excuse me, and, and becomes part of our culture? So is it music or, or sports or whatever it is that goes along with this, uh, with this uh, definition? So I have now, <coughs> hope you have, sorry, ongoing problem here. You have an ongoing uh, understanding now, I hope, about what makes up cognition and then what it means as far as a definition for culture. Um, you share all of this information, again, generationally, uh, does it change? It can. What if you? What if your culture uh, moves to a new area? You have to change some things. You have to change your living conditions. What kind of shelters do you build, etc.? What's the transportation? Uh, if you live around the Arctic Circle, way up north in Alaska, even sometimes uh, the main mode of transportation be a dog sled. You can't use that at Myrtle Beach doesn't work too well. I haven't tried it, but I can't imagine it wouldn't. So <clears throat> let's put this into cross-cultural perspective. The research that's very popular right now has to do with some domains and that, that study of these domains has been narrowed down to a framework. The framework is made up of two things, analytic cognition and holistic cognition. Analytic versus holistic, as it's often said, cognition. And then <clears throat> what's the meaning of that? <clears throat> I'm very sorry. What's the meaning of that? Well, cultural differences uh, primarily are divided between the East and the West. Westernized culture versus Asian culture, East Asian cultures, uh, to be more specific. And what is it saying? It says that Western cultures, which are analytic, which is an analytic culture, an analytic uh, cognition of culture, has to do with... Um, uh, the analysis of your surroundings, everything that's in your life, uh, cause and effect linkages. In other words, we don't accept things, we wanna dig into it. And uh, then we look at variables within those occurrences and we project that objectively. In other words, we take what's going on, we analyze it, and then we make some sense out of it. That's an analytic view. That's an analytic cognition. We make uh, 
we want to make things precise. We don't like the, uh, we're much like the way your brain works. We don't like to be fooled. We like to know that when we're looking at something that we're getting the facts. And then that way it makes it make sense. As opposed to an East Asian uh, cognitive style, which is uh, holistic. And the, they're more concerned with uh, a focus on interrelationships, uh, mutual interdependence, and uh, a multiplicity of explanations as to what is going on and why it's going on. So this should key something that you've heard before. Individualistic cultures and collectivistic cultures. Collectivist cultures depend on one another and they function for the betterment of the whole community. Individualistic cultures uh, function for the benefit of the individual, whether it benefits the culture or not. So you're basically on your own to do the best you can do for you. I'm not talking about a negative approach here either. I'm talking about something that's perfectly acceptable. It could be that you find the cure for COVID. Who knows? Individually. Now, there's something you have to understand to make all that make sense, and that's called attributions. What are attributions? These are inferences that we make. Inferences that... Uh, we view as being the cause, remember we're talking about Western culture here, the cause of events or behaviors, including your own. So you bring into the picture an attribute, and these are also expectations, behavioral expectations. This is produced by your culture, the experience that you gain in living in your culture. Now, how do we govern those? Excuse me, how do we gauge those? Well, we start with something called internal attributions. Attributions that specify the cause of behavior within a person. Uh, they're also known as distributional attributions because they are attributions about others' dispositions. So you're doing something and I'm doing something and we're doing the same thing at the same time uh, because of these internal attributions. If I'm doing it this way, I expect that you would be doing it that way too. Culturally based. Hope that makes sense. Now, if there's an internal, it has to be an external, right? So we have external attributions. These are the attributions that we view as being the reasons behind uh, behaviors not internal. So it's not something that we uh, experience internally and we bring that attribution to the plate. This would be more things like the nature uh, uh, or nature rather, or act of God, they say, or uh, other people affecting you and causing behaviors to occur. So they're both of these working together, internal and external. And then there's this thing called a fundamental attribution error. It's a weird little duck. It's a tendency to explain the behaviors of other people using internal attributions, uh, but explaining your behaviors in the same circumstances from external causes. So stop and think about the things you've done and judging somebody's behavior based on what you feel like should have been done correctly. It's also called correspondence bias. And lastly, and this will be the last thing I talk to you about uh, until tomorrow, and I'll shoot you another lecture to wrap this thing up. Self-serving bias. It's, it's a bias that exists where people tend to uh, attribute good deeds and success to their own internal attributes, kind of uh, chest thumping, but attribute bad deeds or failures to external factors. Now, what does that mean? That means you're blaming others for your failures. I flew an airplane Thursday, I think, no, that was, no, Tuesday, this is Thursday. And I made some rather hard landings and uh, I, I blamed the person on my flight instructor, although I didn't tell him that. 
<laughs> I thought, well, if you had me do something else here, I wouldn't have bounced off the runway. That's what a self-serving bias is. Uh, later, I realized it, uh, it was me. It wasn't his instruction that caused it. It was me being stupid, not handling the airplane like I should have. That's what self-serving bias is. Blame somebody else for your failures. Okay, now you got a kind of a working uh, list here to use for these cultural cognitions. Um, as you study for tests, pay attention to the cliff notes that you see, the margin notes, I'm sorry, not cliff notes, the margin notes, because uh, that gives you a good understanding of what's in the paragraphs on the pages that you're reading, hint, hint. All righty, I'll be I'll be back with you uh, later on, hopefully uh, uh, early tomorrow, and put together this final lecture for the week, and we'll talk about emotion. So uh, have a wonderful, wonderful evening. <laughs>